of God this morning. I hope you're thankful that you've been redeemed. You've been set free from the shackles that bind us in our sin and set free to have heaven one day, but Christ right now inside of us, living in and through us to keep us redeemed every day. If you have your Bibles, John chapter 18 and John chapter 19 is where we'll be this morning. Took a detour last week to look at Jesus Christ and him empowering us on a mission to make disciples of all nations. But we've been in a study entitled, I Believe. We're walking through the Apostles' Creed, but more importantly, we're walking through God's holy word and the important doctrines of our faith, the true gospel of Jesus Christ as recorded to us in his holy word. The word in Latin for I believe is credo, hence the Apostles' Creed. The myth is that the disciples came up with this creed, but we can't prove that in history, but we do know about 40 to 60 years after Jesus ascended into heaven to be at the right hand of God Almighty the Father, that the early church was using this creed to teach the basic doctrines from the scripture. And since many Christians were illiterate, they could not read, they would memorize the creed to understand the important aspects that we should not waver from, from the gospel of Jesus Christ. Here's the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father, almighty maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. This morning we'll look at suffered under Pontius Pilate, Next week, we'll just focus on was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day, he rose from the dead. He ascended to heaven, and he sits at the right hand of God the Father, Almighty. From thence, he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, one holy church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I believe. It's important what you believe. The Apostles' Creed is Trinitarian. Starts off with God the Father, then it goes to Jesus Christ. That's the section we're on this morning and will be for several weeks, and then it ends with the Holy Spirit. But the Apostles' Creed is also in chronological order that God existed as the Father and God created through Jesus and the Holy Spirit the heavens and the earth. Then he sent his son Jesus to be born, the God-man. He was already here as God, but he put on flesh and he came to this earth and he lived and he died on the cross to pay for our sins, what we deserve to go to hell forever and pay. And then the Holy Spirit was ushered in at Pentecost so that now those who believe in Jesus Christ have the Holy Spirit at the moment God saves them to indwell them, to empower them, to lead them every single day. I believe. It's important what you believe. Once again, I, I wanna remind you that everything that we'll say about Jesus is based on what the Bible says about Jesus. I've noticed that people that have a problem with Jesus and who he says he is has a problem with the Bible and what the Bible says about Jesus. I believe this is God's holy word from cover to cover and God said it. He spoke through people like Peter and Paul and different people in the scriptures, but. He's the one who spoke his holy word. It's not for us to tell God who he is and who he's supposed to be. It's for us to accept who he tells us he is in his holy word. It's how he reveals himself to us. And what does it mean that Jesus suffered on our behalf? We'll talk about the cross. We'll talk about Calvary next Sunday. But this Sunday, I want to focus on what happened to Jesus Christ under Pontius Pilate, how he suffered even before he was nailed to the old rugged cross. Wrap your mind around this morning that God himself, who did not have to suffer, who is perfect in every way, chose willingly to suffer on your behalf and mine. So that we could worship him today, so we could sing about how much we love him, so we could thank him for his grace. Matthew 27, if you have your handout, will be in John 18 and 19 primarily. But Matthew 27, is on the screen and in your handout, verse 22. Pilate said to them, 
then what shall I do with Jesus who is called Christ? They all said, let him be crucified. And he said, what evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, let him be crucified. Notice the question Pilate asked, then what shall I do with Jesus who is called the Christ? Every one of us that's ever lived or will live on this planet will all have to answer that question. What we will do individually with Jesus Christ. What will you do with Jesus who is called the Christ? They crucified him. And we crucify him over and over again every time we sin against Almighty God. What will you do with Jesus? If you understand the trials, I want to catch you up. This is, we're going to get into the fourth, fifth, and sixth session, if you will, the trials of Jesus after he was arrested. He has already faced Annas. He's already gone to Caiaphas and the Sanhedrin and been tried at night, which was illegal according to the Jewish customs. So the third phase was they had a mock trial with Caiaphas and the Sanhedrin that morning to make what they did that night illegally look like it was legal. They were saying that Jesus was guilty of blasphemy because he was claiming to be the Son of God, which he is. And now we get to the three phases of Pilate. He'll, we'll go to Pilate, then to Herod, and then back to Pilate. The Jewish leaders wanted the crucifixion to be legal. And for it to be legal, the Jews had to send it to Rome, to the Romans, for Pilate to handle. The Jews did not have the authority to sentence someone to death. That had to come from the Romans. That had to come from the one who was in charge, which is, at this time, Pilate. Notice in John chapter 18, you're going to first see a very religious crowd. I want you to see the irony here. The suffering under Pontius Pilate, what is going on with this religious crowd? They're leading from the Sanhedrin, from Caiaphas, now to Pilate, John 18, 28. Then they led Jesus from the house of Caiaphas to the governor's headquarters. It was early morning. They themselves did not enter the governor's headquarters so they would not be defiled, but could eat the Passover. They're religious, and they're caught up in their religion, but they don't understand who Jesus is and what they're doing with the King of kings and Lord of lords, the Savior of the world. You see, at this time, it's Passover. The Jews had sacrificial lambs ready. They had ridden their house of any leaven. They were getting ready to kill the Passover lambs that afternoon. So they would not go into the Roman officials' place, the Gentiles, if you will, where there was leaven because they would be deemed unclean and unable to celebrate the Passover. They're hollering, crucify Jesus, but they're so religious, they don't want to defile themselves with the Passover. What can we learn from that? How often are we caught up in religion, but we don't realize what we're doing with Jesus Christ? We get caught up in customs instead of what God's holy word says and how we've always done it before. All that matters is what Jesus himself says if he says it, that settles it, whether we believe it or not. They're religious, they're spiritually blonde. Do you think they realize that Jesus is the Passover lamb, the one? They don't want to become unclean so they cannot celebrate with their Passover lambs and Jesus is the Passover lamb. Go to the next verse in John 18, verse 29. So Pilate went outside of them and said, what accusation do you bring against this man? Now they're going from being religious and caught up in their religion to being very sarcastic. They answered him, if this man were not doing evil, we would not have delivered him over to you. Paul says, I don't see anything wrong with this guy, Jesus. And they say, if he wasn't an evil man, an evil doer from the Greek language, we wouldn't have brought you somebody that wasn't guilty, Pilate. They're being very sarcastic, the Jews against the Romans, and they call him an evil 
doer, when he is the perfect, righteous one. And who are they going to release in his place? An evildoer, Barabbas, but they're going to tell Jesus, our Savior, the only perfect one in this world, that he's a worker of evil. Verse 31, Pilate said to them, take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. The Jews said to him, it is not lawful for us to put anyone to death. Verse 32, this was to fulfill the word that Jesus had spoken to show by what kind of death he was going to die. If they did not take Jesus to Pilate, he could not be crucified and therefore the prophecy would not have been foretold correctly because the Jews did not have the authority to crucify anyone. So it must go to Pilate in God's sovereign control, in God's sovereign will. Let's look at six questions in John 18, beginning in verse 33, that Pilate asked. And then we're going to look at how our Savior was a suffering servant in John chapter 19. The first question is the starting question in John 18, verse 33. So Pilate entered his headquarters again, and he called Jesus, and he said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Pilate says this as if he's surprised. Scripture says there was nothing becoming of Jesus as a human being to make someone behold him. He looked like an average person. He did not dress like an earthly king. And Pilate looks at him and says, are you the king of the Jews? Here's Jesus' answer. Do you say this of your own accord? You come up that by yourself, Pilate? Or do others say it to you about me? That's the starting question. Pilate looks at him and he says it many times. I find nothing wrong with this man. Y'all are saying he's claiming to be the king of the Jews. He doesn't look like a king. Now the scornful question. Verse 35. Pilate answers, and here's his question again. Am I a Jew? Jesus, you're saying, are you saying this of your own accord? Or if somebody told you, and Pilate says, I'm not a Jew, so who would tell me from the Jews? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? I mean, they're claiming you're an evildoer. What have you really done? See the bias between Pilate, the Roman, and Jesus, the Jew? The hatred between the two different races? Now we see the serious question in verse 36. It's actually at the end of verse 35. What have you done? And Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. Are you an earthly king? He says, my kingdom is not an earthly kingdom. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting. But I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from the world. Pilate says, what are you being charged of? Are you really the king of the Jews? And Jesus' answer, very serious answer to a serious question is, I'm not an earthly king. I don't look like an earthly king. And if I was an earthly king, then when they arrested me, my followers would have fought for my earthly kingdom and for me. And besides Peter raising his sword and cutting off an ear that was put back on, they ran in the opposite direction. Because Jesus is saying, my kingdom is not of this world. My kingdom is a spiritual kingdom. Here's the sobering question in verse 37. Then Pilate said to him, so you are a king. Pilate's a little confused. Jesus answered, you said that I'm a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. What an incredible statement from Jesus. Jesus says, the reason why I was born in Bethlehem, why I came to this earth as a God-man and I put on flesh, was to suffer and die so that I'm, because I'm the spiritual King of kings and Lord of lords. And the only way for salvation to be offered is through my death, burial, and resurrection. Do we realize how much Jesus suffered for us as our substitute in our place? Now you're going to see a very speculative question in verse 38. 
Pilate said to him, and this is what the world is asking every day, what is the truth? We live in a relative world. Whatever's true for you is fine. Whatever's true for me is fine. If it's okay for you, do it. If it's okay for somebody else, that's okay as well. That same question has been asked for thousands of years. What is truth? And after he said this, he went back outside of the Jews and he told them, again, I find no guilt in him. We get to look back to this story. But when it was happening, Jesus says, if you knew the truth, you'd know who I really am. And we know now, John 14, 6, that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. That no one comes to the Father but through him. That Pilate was looking at a person, the God-man, who is the truth. Now we get to the very scandalous question, the last question in chapter 18. But if you have a custom that I should release one man for you at the Passover, now notice what Pilate is trying to do because he finds no guilt in Jesus. So do you want me to release you the king of the Jews? Pilate's trying to help Jesus. There's a custom here that on Passover, I'll release to you anyone you want. How about the king of the Jews? I find nothing wrong with them. And they cried out again, no, not this man, not Jesus, but Barabbas. And it says, now Barabbas was a robber. He was a criminal. Another passage says he was also a murderer. The guiltless one is replaced by someone who is guilty and let go. What an incredible picture of what happens on the cross at Calvary. The guiltless one is replaced on the cross, Jesus, for all of us who are guilty of sin and deserve death and hell. Now, if you have your Bibles, John chapter 19. Let's look at our Redeemer that we just sang about and how he suffered on our behalf. Deuteronomy 25 tells us about 40 lashes minus one, which is 39, and how that if somebody had that many lashes, it would almost beat them to death. That 40 lashes would kill a normal person. Pilate's going to have him scourged, the Roman beating. So Pilate entered his headquarters, I'm sorry, verse 1 of 19. Then Pilate took Jesus and flogged him. 39 lashes. 13 on the right shoulder, 13 on the left shoulder, 13 in the small of his back. Usually they would pull him tight over a stump, hold him down, one person on each side, with a whip with leather endings with glass and brass and stone, anything that could rip open flesh. And they would take turns from one side to the other, 39 lashes. Not to be too gory this morning, but it was known in that day and time that they would rip flesh off the back, that they would scar somebody indefinitely, that it would not be uncommon to see organs. That's our King of Kings and our Lord of Lords. He hasn't even got to the cross yet. And he's suffering, why? So that we could be set free. So that we could sing today like we're set free and be so thankful for his grace and realize it's all because of him and it's not because of us and that we should be thankful that we do not get what we really deserve. Verse two of John 19. And the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and they put it on his head and they arrayed him in a purple robe. They came up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they struck him with their hands as if 39 lashes wasn't enough. They're making fun of our Savior. And Jesus never says a word. Pilate went out again and said to them, See, I'm bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no guilt in him. Pilate was thinking if I beat him almost to death, then maybe they'll feel sorry for him and that'll be enough and we won't have to crucify him. Verse 5, so Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe and Pilate said to him, behold, the man. He's not an earthly king, he's just a man. He bleeds just like a man, Pilate says. 
when the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out. It wasn't enough for them to see Jesus beaten almost to death. They shout out again, crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, take him yourself and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. Notice how many times Pilate says he's innocent. Why? Because he is innocent. He's perfect, blameless. He doesn't deserve to suffer. We deserve to suffer. So Pilate says, you can crucify him. You can have your way with him. I'm washing my hands. The Jews answered him, we have a law, and according to the law, he ought to die because he made himself the son of God. He is the son of God. Not was the son of God. He still is the son of God. When Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. The end of verse 8 says, why is Pilate afraid? If you read church history, Pilate was on the chopping block. Pilate was in serious trouble. He was already told by Caesar that if he caused another riot, it would be his head on the chopping block. See, they were in the Pax Romana. They were in the time of peace. And people could have any religion they wanted, but they could not revolt and they could not start a rebellion. And now Pilate gets afraid because he doesn't want to crucify Jesus, but, the, but he's told, crucify him. We're going to revolt if you don't. So Pilate has a choice to make save his neck and crucify Jesus or his neck is on the line. Notice what choice Pilate took. It's a choice people still take today. To save their own self when they really can't save themselves. It's only God that we sang about earlier who saves. When Pilate, verse 8 again, heard this statement, he was even more afraid. He entered his headquarters again and said to Jesus, where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. So Pilate said to him, you will not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release to you, release you and authority to crucify you? And you got to love Jesus' final answer here. Jesus finally answered him and said, you have no authority over me at all unless it had been given to you from above. This is a part of my father's master plan and the only reason you're able to do it is not you it's God saving people from their sins then he says this therefore he who delivered me over to you Caiaphas has the greater sin as if Jesus told Pilate it's okay for this purpose I've come Caiaphas will be even more guilty because Caiaphas sent them to me to be crucified, Pilate. But Pilate, I know you're trying to save your own skin, but it's okay. Remember what Jesus is going to say on the cross we're going to talk about next week. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. They beat Jesus almost to death. They put a crown of thorns over his head. They hit him. They put a robe on him. They laugh at him. They mock him, and Jesus could have stopped it in an instant. Jesus could have had 10,000, 10,000, and 10,000 more angels come and destroy everyone that was there. But he willingly chose to suffer. I believe he suffered under Pontius Pilate because of his great love for you and for me. He willingly suffered. He did it because he wanted to, because he knew through his pain was the only way for us to be set free. And Isaiah, I believe 53, it says, by his stripes we are healed. Yes, he atoned for our sins on the cross at Calvary. When it grew dark and God's wrath was poured out on him for the sins that should be poured out on us from God's wrath forever in a place called hell, he atoned for our sins then. But I have to think, that he was doing some atoning for our sins when he suffered on our behalf, even at his beating. By his stripes, we are healed. I deserve to be beaten. I deserve to be made a public mockery. 
I mean, this is Passover time. Some people estimate a million people are there. We know a few months later in Acts, that's about how many people are there. And we're told from where all the world they're from. Everybody's here. Everybody's on the scene. Here is Jesus with his back ripped open. And they're laughing at him, spitting at him, hitting him. And the only time he answers, he tells Pilate, there'd be no authority given to you unless this was my father's will. My father has given you this authority because I must suffer under Pontius Pilate, the Roman leader, the only one able to give somebody the sentence of crucifixion that was prophesied, Psalms 22, a thousand years before Jesus came, hundreds of years before crucifixion was even in existence to fulfill the prophecy and so that Christ could go to the cross for us, but he suffered for us even before he got there. That will change the way you worship God, church. It'll change the way you look at God's sovereignty and his grace and his mercy. It won't, it won't let you come into church all boastful about you and what you've done for God all week long. It'll have you come into God's house the way you worship him all week long, just in gratitude and thanks and love that God would save somebody like me and like you and suffer in our place because we don't deserve it. Jesus didn't get what he deserved. He's the God man. He's perfect in every way. He is blameless. No fault. Pilate said it over and over again. I find no fault with him. And why is he crucified? What legal reason? Because he says he's the son of God. And he is. He's the God man. The only way to be saved. Every day I fall more in love with Jesus. Every day I'm so thankful for when I understand more and more what he's done for me that I do not get what I deserve. I get his grace. I get his mercy. And that Jesus took on himself everything that I deserve. And he chose to do it. Why? Because he loves you and he loves me not just to save us, but to transform us every single day of our life. I'm sensing God doing some amazing things in his church here. Every Sunday, maybe it's just how God's changing me, but every Sunday I feel more and more people are coming to his house because they love him and want to worship him and want to give him the glory that's due his name and want to give him gratitude and because they truly believe I believe in God the Father, almighty maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his son, our Lord, who was conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of a virgin, suffered under Pontius Pilate. And next Sunday, we're going to look at and was crucified. And while that's important, and why his death is important, and why his resurrection is important, these are all crucial to the gospel. And the reason I believe it is because Jesus said it. Let's go to the Lord in prayer.